Well, welcome everybody. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. Well, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. And welcome to Brain Club. Share screen, get us oriented to our conversation. Uh, tonight we'll be discussing and hearing from autistic professionals supporting autistic people. Brain Club, of course, um, uh, for those of you who are new to our community, this is our intentionally created education space for the collective All Brains Belong community for the purpose of providing education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. It's about bringing people together based on a shared vision of what's possible with the idea of contributing to systems change by shifting social norms through developing shared language and promoting new ways of thinking and being. Um, so that then you go out into the rest of your life, um, uh, uh, spreading spreading the word, and that uh, after experiencing something that maybe maybe depending on what environments you're in, maybe uh, quite different from the from from the rest of the world. Um, this is not uh, for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group or a place to process individual circumstances. This is for education purposes only. All Friends Belong has other types of programs that do those other things, but this one is not those. All forms of participation are welcome. You can have your video on or off, and even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of that. So feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat, um, whatever needs doing. Um, our panelists today, all three of them um, live in different time zones. And so they are all asynchronous. So um, the bulk of today's Brain Club um, will consist of pre-recorded interviews. So during that time, um, uh, we'll have the chat box going as an option. You certainly do not need to partake in the chat, but the chat box will, will go in. I'll facilitate that as we listen to the main action on the screen. You're also welcome to send private messages if you're more comfortable that way. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this experience safe for all participants, we prioritize the group's needs over that of the individual. And one of the ways that we do that is to tread, tread carefully around sensitive topics. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to open the chat box because it always finds a way of closing itself. Okay, there we go. Um, speaking of the chat, we know the chat is not for everyone. It is um, an important accommodation for many community members. It is also distracting and overwhelming for other community members. So um, our best advice is that um, if you're someone who the chat box bothers you, you can disable chat preview by clicking the up caret next to the chat box and checking off the show chat preview so that the chat box goes away. All right, so we are continuing our April 2024 theme, Autistic Culture. Uh, before we begin, I, I also want to thank our Brain Club for supporters for making tonight's Brain Club possible. Um, you know, uh, really deeply grateful to, to be able to present, um, you know, a, 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 a video like that you're about to see um, and to be able to have an impact that way and to be able to compensate tonight's presenters for sharing their lived experience. Thank you, Brain Club supporters. Okay, so why do we talk about employment every month? Because we do. We talk, we've talk. we been talking about it every month since May 2022. It's something that our community advisory board asked us to do. And it's because um, autistic adults have a four to eight times higher rate of unemployment and 75% of ADHDers struggling with employment related challenges. And employment challenges are related to health in both directions. So if you unemployment increases the probability of developing a chronic health condition by 83%. And if you have a chronic health condition, um, when your access needs are not accommodated, it makes it hard to work. So big problem, big contribution to poor health for neurodivergent people. 
What we don't want, I have no idea why the color change just happened as I imported my slides. I'm sorry about that. What we don't want, that says, is the square peg being hammered to fit into the round holes. Because what happens? We break the peg, right? And so many people are being shoved into containers that don't work for them. And what happens? We, we run out of battery. And what does that look like? Burnout. Neurodivergent burnout, a condition commonly experienced by people of all ages, characterized by mental and physical exhaustion, loss of tolerance to stimuli, and loss of skills. And so um, uh, this, is, this is the way that um, the, these authors, uh, Raymaker et al., in 2020, uh, article called Having All Your Internal Resources Exhausted Beyond Measure and Being Left with No Cleanup Crew, Defining Autistic Burnout. Right, so this is this is common, and this is um, a, a a pathway that many late identified um, neurodivergent adults kind of discover their true selves um, through suffering and slogging through 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 burnout. And so, um, what we are going to hear about, we're going to hear from three autistic professionals tonight: um, Iris Warchow. Uh, who is an autistic physical therapist uh, who on social media uh, uses the handle autistic physical therapist. Um, uh, Iris is going to talk about uh, her experiences as someone who is not self-employed um, uh, versus we've got our two other panelists uh, who, who are. And so we're going to hear from three different perspectives on navigating burnout navigating, and it's not like a one and done thing, like the continuous process of navigating, meeting their own access needs as they support their clients. Um, and the, 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 the big, the big shift of um, how do we balance? How do we do this, this, this thing called work? How do we reimagine what that can look like? And so uh, we are uh, very grateful to Iris Warchall, Doug Blecker, who is the founder of Autism Personal Coach, and Matthew Lawrence um, uh, from the Actually Autistic Coach. So thank you to our panelists. And uh, with that, David, take it away. You know, our panel's about uh, autistic professionals supporting autistic people. And so I'd love to hear about what you do and how did you start doing that? Yeah, autistic professionals supporting autistic people is one of my favorite topics. Um, so I'm the founder of Autism Personal Coach for the last 11 years. We've provided uh, coaching to autistic adults and teens. And so I started doing that work because I, prior to that, for about three years, I had facilitated a support group for autistic adults. Uh, and and for those and for that time i learned so much from the adults in the group and one of the things that was glaring that i learned was that we need we need support we are you know we don't have there are not supports out there our support networks are rather small my name is iris and i'm a physical therapist and i also I am autistic and I do some advocacy work around improving care for autistic patients. How did you come to start doing the work that you're doing? Like, I think a lot of people who are um, late identified autistic folks, um, you know, I had come to identify that I was autistic after having a kid who was identified as being autistic as well and i you know at that point i had already been practicing as a pt for some time and i just really quickly started to see how in my training around autism and autistic people there were just so many gaps and so much outdated information, so much misinformation. But the PT community around the time when I started, you know, really looking into this, we weren't yet having these conversations, right? And so I felt like it was 
just something where we, uh, you know, in my profession needed to start doing some catch up work. This panel that we're doing is about autistic people supporting autistic people. Um, and so I would love to tell, tell us about yourself and how you've come to be doing the work you're doing. Yeah, so I, I'm a, I, I don't love that word coach, but I know that a lot of people like that word coach, but I, I think of myself as a, an educator and actually where I live here in France, where I'm actually licensed as an autism educator, that's my official kind of title. Um, and I lead seminars and workshops and do one-on-one -on -one kind of peer support. And I've been doing that for nearly 15 years in one way or another. Um, I first got into it when I was in college. Um, my first year of college, I didn't have the term back then, but today we would call it autistic burnout. You know, going to school for the first time outside of your home and all the changes, and drugs and alcohol and classes and socializing and a million things went into burnout, which they called, you know, an autistic depression. I think that was the term that they used at the health center at the time. And, you know, I remember them going and them asking, oh, you know, have you ever been, you know, assessed for autism or anything like that? And I go, yeah, you know, I was a kid, but like, I'm good now. Right? I had gone, I was diagnosed as a kid and had gone through the entire battery of what an autistic kid in the Northeast of the United States went through in the 1990s. And I sat there telling the psychologist, yeah, like I'm over it. Like I went to therapy I'm, look at me, I'm at college, I'm great. And he just looked at me, you know, like a puppy about to get put down uh, and said, you know, that's not really how it works. Maybe, you know, you should get in touch with some other um, autistic students here at the university and, you know, support. And while I had always known other autistic people, I never really actively engage in any kind of community of such, right? I had most I had done is I had some of my classmates who I didn't always like, right? You know, there's always this like false idea that, oh, all autistic people are besties. Not when well, not always. Um and you know we had this blog forum back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and now meeting with other students who were autistic. And that was the first time, you know, being 18 years old where I heard that being autistic wasn't a horrible end of life thing to be embarrassed about. Like I had always kind of grown up thinking that my brain formed. That was how I conceived of myself. And for the first time at 18, I started learning that that wasn't the case. So while I'm not late identified, for me, that, that journey of understanding that being autistic is not a curse, it is not a, um, a deficiency, right? Definitely a disability, but not a deficiency. Um, wasn't a bad thing. I, 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 so I got to have that journey anyway, right? And that's when I started hanging out with other autistic people and learning about neurodiversity and all these things. And while that might not sound super exciting to some people today, this is the early years of the Iraq war. The word neurodiversity was really new and really not, this was not a normal way of thinking, right? Like people weren't talking like this. So that blew my mind away. And, you know, I went through college and I got out of my burnout. It was really good. I started, you know, what we would call unmasking more, right? And I went to go study abroad and I went out to the U.S. And when I came back, um, somebody from then, they called it the special services for, you know, neural, I don't even remember what they called it. It was a really horrible ableist name today. They called it the Neurodiversity Center. But back then, it wasn't called the Neurodiversity Center. This really nice lady, Marianne, she asked me in a very patronizing, but well-meaning way, like, oh, Matthew, you're so well-adjusted. Could you talk to the other students and like get them prepared to go abroad, the other autistic students, and mentor them? And I said, well, yeah, sure. I would do that, right? And she was doing it from a really not a great place, right? But okay, you know, we have to give a little grace to people. 20 years ago who didn't know things, right? People apparently were supposed to still give it today, but definitely 20 years ago. Um, and that was my first time of mentoring people who are younger than me about what it's like to be an autistic college student and what it's like to go abroad and go to a new country and have the new cultural context and all that stuff. And that was really fun and I really enjoyed that. And I graduated school and I moved abroad 
And I really liked that. So I told the school, like, if you ever have people coming here or students from here going to the US, let me know and I'll keep doing that. And I kept doing it and I've been doing it for the last 15 years. And I still do it. And over time, I would organize different kind of support groups and social groups. And I, I developed a group for people dealing with addiction who are autistic. And, and I moved around a lot in my career moved me around and I lived in four different countries, five different countries. And I always was kind of meet with autistic people wherever I was and organize groups and organize social events. I was doing kind of even on FaceTime before we had Zoom, we used to have, you know, FaceTime group calls and we would ha and Skype and things like that and organize things like that. And I always did that on the side and as a volunteer and as a peer support person and I would talk like I'm talking now about what it's like to be a peer support person, not a worker, right? That wasn't my job. It was something I did on my own time. And I also, had, I started a few different companies and had a pretty successful business career. And I was really passionate about mentoring other autistic entrepreneurs and people who just want to do their own thing, not necessarily entrepreneurs, but you know, hey, I'm a really good photographer. How do I start my photography business? And how do I get through all of the things of filing this paper and doing that paper and all the kind of executive function stuff? Um, plus still working with students and I'm always doing that on the side. And then in 2019, um, I went to burnout and I did pretty well. I had lasted like a good 13 years or so without being in burnout, which is a pretty good run. Um, but ultimately it was no longer sustainable. And it was the worst kind of burnout, you know, depending on how many levels you have, a level three or a level four, a level five, level six, whatever your maximum level in your way of burnout, I'm a five level guy, but the worst, the, the, la the last level, the worst kind, the one where you're not getting out of bed for weeks, the one where everything is terrible. And I'm, I didn't know what to do. And I knew that I couldn't, you know, continue living the way I was. And as often happens, I have a really smart partner. Um, and a lot of us are really fortunate to have smart partners uh, who said to me, you know, the place where you are most happy, where you're doing the best, where you're smiling, where you are the most relaxed when you're doing those groups and you're having those circles and maybe you want to do that. And that's like, maybe like as a job, like that, like that could be because a big part of my burnout was my job my career wasn't really meeting my autistic needs there you know there was a point for me a few years after i had started working as a physical therapist where i had been working in a setting that was not at all meeting my access needs it was a very busy, high volume outpatient orthopedic clinic. And there was constantly so much background noise, um, so many distractions, so much, uh, so much fluorescent lighting, so much visual clutter, um, you know, smells. <laughs> I'm very olfactory sensitive, you know, it, so it was the situation that was really overwhelming for me and i'd been pushing through you know the sensory environment and you know transitioning between you know appointment to appointment without processing time um, without and um, you know being able to check in with my body to feel what I needed, right? Uh, did I need water? Um, was I about to pass out because I was too hungry, right? And so I got, you know, I got to this place where I would just, you know, I knew that I was burnt out. I didn't yet recognize what my access needs were, um, but I knew that I needed to make a change. There's, there's a lot of people who they just feel stuck. They just feel stuck. Like, do you remember if you could rewind to when you were in your previous practice setting and you were recognizing that this wasn't a good fit and like you knew you had to make a change? Like, do you remember like what 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 was going through your mind that that 
allowed you to even just start like looking to make a change as opposed to like, oh yeah, this sucks. Like, but I can't imagine anything different because it also takes too much executive functioning to like make an exit plan. Yeah. Well, I also really appreciate that um, you're describing that aspect of the stuck kind of situation where I think a lot of people wind up getting to um, if they're in a situation that's not a good fit because then, you know, your bandwidth is taken up, right? And that's a hard situation. And uh, I very much had felt like that um, around the situation that I had been navigating, um, being in an environment that wasn't working well for me. And I think just, you know, realistically, one thing that was helpful for me to recognize was that I needed to be patient with myself, with figuring out what my game plan was going to be and with implementing a change because there is that aspect of inertia that is hard to move past when you're at or over your bandwidth, right? And at the same time, I think once I came to the realization that continuing to function beyond my bandwidth was just not sustainable, you know, that was the ultimate impetus for making a change and it um you know i think it was something that i found that now i can be on the lookout for in my life when i do wind up noticing myself feeling like i'm getting into that stuck kind of situation that's a sign an early sign, right, that I need to be just taking a look at things and figuring out, okay, what's at least one thing that I can take off my plate right now? What's one thing that I can change right now in order to make things a little easier and have the bandwidth to even think about next steps? I think there's so many people who are stuck they're stuck. They're in that place. They can't imagine something different because it actually requires more cognitive capacity to like vision and dream than 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 they have than they have access to. Like, um, I appreciate you naming that. You know, you you credit having a really smart partner who had the idea, and that's how you got out of that stuck place. But still, there's probably some. You probably had to do some additional like thinking or navigating or in some way to like like bridge that gap out of stuckness do you remember back then and can you can you speak to that at all yeah i mean it's you know people always ask me like oh well can, is there like an express version is there like the triangle version on the subway of getting through burnout and my answer is always the same. You can't hustle and grind your way out of burnout. And the more you try to hustle and grind your way out of burnout, the more you're actually going to, you're going to dig yourself deeper. Cause it's actually, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how burnout works, right? Um, you, you go out because you're not getting enough mental, physical rest. So by taking your, you're building up a deficit, right? A debt. And so by doing more, you're adding debt. You're not actually, you know, you're not, priming the pump, so to speak. You're just kind of, so it's it's slow, right? I started by doing, you know, talking to one person, you know, once a day for a little bit, and then another person, and then maybe two people, and then three people, and very slow, right? Like today I, I see a lot of people, um, but in, for the first, year two years it was you know slow really slow like the tortoise right step i don't know if anybody watching here and attending is a hiker right or likes to go climbing or hike um every experienced hiker knows you do not run 
you look at your foot, one foot in front of the next foot, in front of the next foot, even if you know that path really well, you never know what's going to happen. You never know if there's a little divot or there's something that's, or you get something stuck in your shoe. Every step really slow. When you start even doing a few more steps, that's when you fall. It's when you hurt yourself. And then when you're sick, right? You're a doctor, you know, right? What happens when somebody, they're, they're sick all week. The first day they feel good, they go out and they go do everything. They're back in your office the next day. Yes. Yes. Psycho. So that would, it's like one of the laws of life. You, you can't do it. Yes. And then when you layer on it, like so many autistic people have um, what, what we call all the things, um, you know, the constellation of intertwined medical conditions, where it's like the boomer bust cycle that we're, you know, they're in a state of post exertional malaise and feeling like crap because they felt a little bit better and then they, you know, they overdid it. And yeah. I think that it's really helpful for you to hear you describe, like, as at a concrete level, like, I started with talking with one person. Right, because I think that it's it's um it feels like it's hard to tell people you know we we because there's people who are in a state of like they're they're currently in a toxic work environment. We know that you can't stay there and ever be out of burnout because your access needs are not being met. You're being thwarted. You're being actively harmed. Like you're draining your battery all day long. Like this, we got to get out of this. But it, it may not be practical or someone may not have, you know, the privilege, the economic privilege of being able to like, I'm going to quit my job and like start doing the thing I want to do. Right? So, so, so the side hustle can be really slow as like the yeah. long game of the off ramp out of chaos. What do you oh, think yeah, about that? I wasn't able to, well, I, so I was in a, a fortunate position where I could reduce the hours I was doing in my, in my career. And I did. Um, but even then it wasn't a clean break, so to speak for years, right? For years. And some people never get that opportunity. And yes, is there a aspect of it saying that like, if this is a, a job, which is taking a hundred percent out of you every time that you need to consider a new path is that, and whether or not you have privilege, not privilege. Sure. But most of us can't do that. So it has to, you know, you have to maybe come up with a plan. You have to start maybe looking at other things, but then it becomes an issue of, oh, how do we manage what we have, right? And even if that's a very, very small thing, what people often do is they wanna rush into one thing or the other, which actually can make things much worse, right? Um, you have, and I, and I get it, like for a lot of us who are also ADHD, right? I am like that, that little, those small steps, aren't easy to do, right? It's all or nothing. People are like, okay, well, that's great um, that you knew what you kind of wanted to do, um, but I'm not really sure, you know, what I wanted to do. I'd love to support other autistic people, but I'm not really sure how I would do that. And I guess what I always say is just really start slow. I just started with like co coaching like one or two people initially, you know, one or two clients. And I think, you know, if a lot of times if we we can start small, like we don't necessarily have to immediately quit our jobs. Maybe maybe someone might need to do that. Um, I, I I did, but like we we're so we're so good at so many different things. We're so creative. We're we we have some talents that like people might not even think about. We're good at you know cutting people's cutting our own hair sometimes. Cut you know can you cut people's hair? Can you you know, are you really good at like mowing the lawn, being out in nature? These like there's so many different things that we're good at that we can that we can help other autistic people with that aren't good, maybe good at those things that and that need those supports. So, you know, a lot of times we're online supporting other autistic people and we're not getting paid for it, you know, so like there's all these different things that we can do um, to 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 help people and I and I think it's if you know just kind of sit down and think about it it's it, it is there's it's I don't think it's too difficult to figure out ways that we can in some ways um, be paid for some of these things.
What an awesome note to, to wrap up on. You know, like, I think, I think this is this, what you just said right there about ways to support other autistic people, because, you know, we're not a homogenous group. We're all going to have our unique strengths and things that are more difficult. And we're going to have our, you know, our unique zones of genius. And like, what would it look like to have this, you know, this massive network of, of interdependent community? Um, where everyone yeah. can have, you know, access the resources they need, um, and 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 not spend, you know, all of their spoons being thwarted in situations that aren't working for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and yeah. So I just I just encourage people to 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 think about those things and. I also encourage them not to get hung up on the word professional, because I think we tend to think about it in neuronormative terms. Professional is anything you can get paid for. We, what we're trying to name for people or trying to model or conversations around like how, how do we as individuals get our own access needs while doing the work that is uniquely ours to do? What do you think yeah. about that? Well, you know, I can share um, that for me, this has been a process that I think is going to be an ongoing process that I navigate right uh, over the course of my career. I knew that at the very least, I needed a work environment where I could have a more reasonable pace right where i could work with one person at a time and so you know that was the first change that i made and i wound up finding a clinic to move to that actually wound up being a better fit that i'm still at um and while i at the time didn't recognize that you know, I really needed to be thinking about my sensory needs as well. Um, <clears throat> the environment that I moved to wound up being a much better fit in terms of sensory needs as well. And then uh, over time, I think it's, it's for me been a process of just recognizing, okay, what can I, you know, as I develop this understanding of, oh, I am really auditory sensitive. I am really olfactory sensitive. Then what are the things that I can be doing in order to change my environment? And with a lot of the sensory stuff, I feel like that can wind up being really powerful. And also some of the stuff that, at least in my experience, and you know, I know I, I probably have been lucky around this, um, but I feel like asking for shifts in the sensory environment usually you know usually is a pretty straightforward conversation with others that you're working with then there's a whole uh, you know there are all these other sides of things that i found um you know are a little harder to navigate and that i'm still navigating around you know communication you know, how do I communicate with others that I'm working with in terms of, you know, uh, I know that I'm going to interpret what's communicated to me very literally, right? And, uh, you know, so these have been conversations that I've had with folks that I've, that I work with and that I think wind up being more like ongoing kind of conversations. And I think it's a process, right? I mean, for any of us who have been operating without knowledge of our access needs for most of our lives, then it's it's a long process, right? Absolutely. And especially like 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 on top of that being taught like not just implicitly but like explicitly like this is how you do the thing and you're like 
and, and, and so you're also unlearning that at the same time that you're learning about yourself and then how to communicate those access needs to the people around you. And then like, especially when you're communicating with people who don't have a framework for even thinking about access needs, everybody has access needs, but you know, all of that. So, I mean, like, I mean, I, I guess if you were, if you were to have rewound two and a half years, I would never have identified as an entrepreneur. I would never have thought about starting a thing. I would have thought it was, you know, it's too hard. It's this, it's that. And, and so like place of stuckness, but also like, I, I, I think, I think I didn't know that what this would actually look like is spending most of my day asking people for help. I mean, also paying them uh, to, to, to advise me on things. Um, but, but like the idea that you don't, you don't do this alone um, and you don't have to. It's, it's, it's like you said, the why, that gap between the world you see and the world you need to exist and how you want to spend your time, I think, but the, the but the work of coaching in turn of like just even like organizing the brain or you know having someone help you map it out visually, the stuff that's all mm -hmm. up there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, like people will look at me, Mel, and they'll think like, okay, you've been running a business for eleven years that you made it through COVID, and we've we even grew during COVID. And people look at me with like the quotations of being successful, you know, quote, and, you know, I've been reflecting on that a lot lately. And what I've been reflecting on is the fact that if I worked a nine to five job, I don't think I could make it. I don't think like just my energy levels as I've gotten older, um, I'm 40, 45 now, like, I don't see myself being able to maintain a nine to five job with probably an employer or manager that doesn't understand my needs and an environment that certainly doesn't work for me. I just don't know how I'd be able to navigate that to maintain employment. So I think like being an entrepreneur, that's pretty much how I get my, my needs met. Where <laughs> you're earning income, doing the work you love, um, and you have autonomy over meeting, meeting some of your access needs. Um, that doesn't make it easy, but then, and that doesn't keep people out of burnout either. Um, so, so can, 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 can you share anything that you're like, that you intentionally do to meet your own access needs in the conditions of having some autonomy over your working conditions? Well, I make it, I, 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 I try as much as possible to apply to my work, the same principles that I apply to my life. And maybe, well, you Mel might not be surprised by what I'm about to say. A lot of people might be right. This is, you know, next level autism, so to speak. But when I meet somebody new, I tell them, this is what I need. And this is how I work, you know? Hi, Mel, I've just met you now for the first time. Great, you should know, Mel, that I know everything I need to do, everything in my calendar, and I work super hard on my calendar, and I work super hard on my schedule, and I do everything, and I use lots of fancy software and planners and things. And so I know if you ask me to do something, I am going to do it. And I understand that you might wanna follow up. But you know, when you follow up with me before seven days, that actually is gonna trigger my PDA. And then I am, it's actually, you think it's gonna make me go faster, it's actually gonna make me go slower. So let's discuss right now that don't do it before seven days. Seven days goes by, hit me up. Something might've happened, right? That's one rule. And then if I see people are go with that, I go to my next boundary, my next boundary, my next boundary. And I try to set that out and let people go, but Matt, you, can't you tell that to like random people on the street? No, not a random person on the street. But if I'm going to start creating a relationship with somebody, right, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a working relationship, et cetera, I like to give out my, you know, the things that help people understand how I operate. Because that one for me is a big one. And so I also tell people I work with the same thing. Now, 
you might ask, well, but Matt, like I, I, I get anxiety if I don't hear from somebody in the seven days, I need four days. Then you and I can talk about it. Maybe I can do four days. Maybe I can't. Let's talk about it. My brain is exploding right now. Okay. I have like so many things just came up for me. So first off, um, the idea that when, when it's safe for, for someone to be so transparent around access needs like why not I try to do that because in my job and my job is not different than your job or anyone who's listening job. all of our jobs require us to deal with people usually even the jobs that are not people facing deal with people i put out what i need i know what's going to take my spoons away and for some people that might not be suitable some people say well i'm paying you x amount of money you need to do what i say well, that you know, the great thing is, is that I'm I'm really fortunate to say that I my mental health is worth more than fifty dollars, and that you might find that offensive. You might say, "Well, I really need that fifty dollars." I understand, but all of us need to be able to create based on our own conditions what our limits are. Now, what would I say? What do you, what do I say to somebody who's not in that position? Obviously, we can't all change jobs, but we always need to be this is how we said before with burnout. Even if you're not yet in burnout, if you see that you're getting towards there, can we think about what your needs are? And can we start thinking about are there other options out there? Maybe there are, maybe there aren't. More times than not, there might be another option out there. I think the thing that I've thought about why people don't start these things, don't as autistic people, because we are so passionate about about supporting other autistic people is because we focus on the how instead of the what and the why. And so if we don't focus on the, the how, the anxiety of it all, the executive functioning of it all, um, if we focus on the what, and the what for me was I wanted to support autistic people to live the lives that they want to, to live. Um, and why? Because I couldn't bear seeing people not live th those lives and 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 somehow the how has worked out uh for these 11 years it just started with me coaching people myself and now we have 13 different coaches about 80 percent of them are autistic themselves and i think and we're now we're coaching people all throughout the united states i love that you broke this down to be talking about this this um the how versus the the what and why because I think you're absolutely right um especially if you have the like I have the kind of brain that I have no idea what done looks like until I'm doing it and so if I'm like gonna quit my terrible job even though it's terrible like I can't even imagine the like I, I just can't even so I shut it down and I'm like I can do the thing the known quantity when you have the kind of brain that derives safety from predictable systems you're going to choose the status quo a lot of the time even though it's ruining your life yeah and I think you know something that I think about a lot is you know because we don't know the how and because of our executive functioning differences we will get stuck and and I think we get stuck because one of my co-occurring conditions is I'm alexithymic. Um, me processing emotions um, can take a while. So I think we get stuck because we're processing things and we don't always have people to process them with. Kind of goes back to our support networks. And so then, you know, we, you know, we, we, we are thinking about all these different things, all these anxieties, not sure about the how, and I think that's where we kind of get stuck. So I think that's where coaching comes in. I'm, I'm very biased. Um, I think coaching can help people to get unstuck. Um, but I think coaching is a part of a bigger the bigger issue is that we don't have support networks and and when we do when we do have support networks we're not using them to our greatest their greatest advantage so i think whether it's a coach whether it's a therapist whether it's a wonderful doctor like dr hauser uh you know a lot of times people don't have that uh, you know a, a 
responsibility. They don't have someone like you in their support network. Whether is it is it is it friends? Is it family? Like going to those people and just talking about these things and trying to process these things, I, I think, are re really important. And if talking isn't your thing, writing about them, doing art about them, listening to music. For me, you know, something that I've realized um, recently for me is, you know, we'll hear a lot of autistic and neurodivergent people talk about music and how they listen to the same song over and over again. And for me, what I've realized, it's about my emotional states. And the, the song that I'm listening to is I'm trying to process that emotion. So I think just all of those things, um, I think, you know, finding different ways, uh, movement is another way, nature. Because I'm thinking about imagining like the movie of your life where you're the main character and you're doing all the things. So you have your main gig, but then you have a side gig, right? So you're doing trainings, you're a content creator. How did you start doing the other stuff? Because I, I almost wonder like for you, is that part of meeting your own access needs to get dopamine in, this, in these other ways? That's a great question. I, th I think that it is and I, um, you know, I had, uh, you know, how had I started with um, some of this? You know, I don't think I had had necessarily, you know, an idea of, you know, what people I might be able to reach and you know start to have conversations with, but I you know, had this goal of, okay, I'm going to put out into the universe that if it's a therapist should be thinking about improving care for autistic patients, right? And <clears throat> that was my goal. And <clears throat> I recognized after, you know, I started doing some things towards that, um, you know, one of the first things that I did was just write, um, <laughs> writing a letter to the people who do the American Physical Therapy Association blog um, saying, hey, we should think about this, right? And it was an opportunity to engage around a passion of mine, right? And that was something that I recognized was very motivating for me and that I could then start to see how having this balance between doing clinical work, which I really enjoy, but also in its own ways, even in an environment that meets my needs pretty well, um, still can be draining for me because I am someone who needs a lot of processing time in order to feel like I'm, uh, you know, I'm regulated after doing, um, you know, kind of very focused one-on-one um, -on -one work with folks, right? And so, you know, I, I saw that, oh, hey, as I'm doing some of this other advocacy work and I'm doing things like developing courses, then this this is work that I can do. This is something positive that I can do for, um, you know, the community, for my profession that is, it's working with other areas of my brain. You know, meeting my access needs by having a little bit more of a balance of the different things that I'm doing. Yeah, and um, there, I, I think that's so well said, like just because you enjoy something and your access needs are met while you're doing it, it still costs, it's still spending bandwidth, spending energy. And so, um, you know, it's like it, it just, just acknowledging that I think like that, 
I don't think I, you know, I, 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 I got my autism diagnosis three years ago next month. And like, I don't, I don't think I knew I had a finite amount of energy. Like, I, like that was like new information to me. Yeah. For me, it was really interesting because even before I'd recognized or understood that I was autistic or even um, what being autistic really meant, um, you know, I had this uh, around that time, um, you know, when my access needs were not being well met, I was spending this time reflecting on why is it that I don't seem to have the energy to do things outside of work, right? I hear that people get home from work and they do things. And <laughs> And it's being able to get my access needs met. It's the ability to primarily work remotely. It's the ability to talk to my team when we have meetings and say, can we just put things on mute and can we just communicate through chat? Um, it's the, you know, it's the ability to manage my energy levels. It's the ability to get my sensory needs met. Um, now, could could those things happen in a traditional neuronormative workplace? Possible, it's possible, but I don't think it's probable. And that's the reason why so many people are struggling to maintain in employment, you know, we see it every day, you know, so often when people reach out to us for coaching, for those that are employed, you know, they might have been, they might be there, you know, a year, three years, five years, 10 years or longer, but they're totally burnt out and it's totally impacting the other parts of their life. And I think that's the, that's the whole other thing about employment that we don't talk about is that we look, our lives are holistic. What happens in our employment situations impact all the other aspects of our life. I could not agree more. I mean, that's like, like that, that's why we do employment support in a medical practice, because like, I can't get you healthy if your employment health is not addressed because you're like slogging along being tortured by the system. There can be this energy state where it, you know, it's hard to even start with doing some movement right and going and so i use the strategy of okay well i'm going to go on a short walk and that is my thing that feels doable right and so it's that small step of okay there's one thing that i know that i can do to make myself feel a little better and often or implement that a small step, then maybe I'll be able to take a medium step. Very often, right, as autistic people, we get stuck in our heads and we get stuck in our loops and we can't see that there's another option out there. But there are options. And just being in groups like Brain Club and being with other autistic people, the ideas start flowing, right? And this is why it's super important for us to kind of be in these spaces where we can just listen to what others are doing, just listening. Because yes, we're all different. All of our situations are different. None of our situations are easy, but there's often there's going to be something that we might be able to use. Uh, I I just mostly want to say that it's wonderful that you have this space where folks are able to engage with these topics and connect with other people who are having similar experiences um, because there's so many people who need that. Thanks, David. Um, and thank you again to Iris and Matthew and Doug. Um, you know, I think as as as, as evidenced by the, uh, the 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 action in the chat, it sounds like a lot of a lot of these reflections, um, you know, really resonating with a lot of people. I did want to wrap us up with um, we just a slide of some reflections of some of the themes that I thought stood out um, from uh, our three panelists' stories. So the idea of small steps, like if you're in level five burnout, as, as, as Matthew said, um, you know, it, it's, it, it you, you literally may not have access to the part of your brain that allows you to, to envision, like to vision cast, like that's, that, that's a different part of the brain 
that may be taken offline um, because you, you know, you, you've lost, uh, you, you're dysregulated, you've lost executive functioning skills. These are like higher order skills. I think we heard from, from uh, all three of our panelists of so the idea of emergence, like the idea of kind of like, um, being open, kind of open to the universe that, you know, you start doing something and if it leads to something else, um, that was something I heard from all three of their stories. The idea of peer mentorship or peer support being really important. Themes of interdependence being connected to and relying on other people. You know, I think we heard um, uh, uh, both from Matthew describing uh, how he got started and Iris talking about how she maintained her, you know, her, her main gig, but then had a side gig that gave her dopamine, right? So it doesn't need, you know, I think most people are don't have the autonomy, privilege, agency to like necessarily like up and quit your job and like go start a new gig. Um, or, but 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 maybe um, considering a side gig that charges your battery enough to mobilize, um, you know, uh, uh, some reserves to actually be plotting out, you know, your next steps. And of course, the the big theme of of of, of discovering and eventually, when it's safe, articulating, expressing your access needs. And I think that, you know, coming to Brain Club, learning from community panelists, um, learning from, from each other, I think that um, often, often, um, uh, and there's a, there's a term for this, uh, social penetration theory, the idea that people become more familiar with their own experience when they hear someone else talking about it or someone else writing about it. Oh, yeah, now I have language to understand that. Um, now, now that all makes sense. Um, so those are those those uh, that's 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 what stood out to me. Um, and and speaking of um, uh, becoming more familiar with different experiences, our book chat next week. So next week's book chat um, is um, a new book called Autistic and Black uh, by Kala Allen Omeza, um, and uh, it's it's it's. Um, a collection of stories profiling um, uh, multiple people of, of their of their experiences. I think um, you know, um, autistic people. We are um, not a homogenous group by any means, and when we think about the intersectional impact of all of the different aspects of identity, um, I look. I I I I, uh, I I I read the book this weekend. Um, I thought it was outstanding, and um, I'm going to pluck out themes. We have video clips of the author. Um, and um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, um, you know, we'll have a, 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 a rich and powerful conversation discussion about it. So um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you all so much for being here and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Bye.